This video was created by the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians to demonstrate proper technique for measuring blood pressure in an office setting. About one in three American adults has hypertension. The American Heart Association estimates the total costs associated with high blood pressure to exceed $40 billion annually. Measurement of blood pressure is used in screening for hypertension and for monitoring the effectiveness of treatment for patients with a diagnosis of hypertension. In the outpatient setting, blood pressure is measured indirectly. It is important to use proper techniques so that readings are consistent and reliable. The 2014 Evidence-Based Guideline for the Management of High Blood Pressure in Adults, report from the panel members appointed to the 8th Joint National Committee, also known as JNC-8, guides current treatment of hypertension. According to JNC-8, patients 60 and older who do not have diabetes or kidney disease need to have blood pressure under 150 over 90. For all other patients, the blood pressure goal is less than 140 over 90. Taking a manual reading of indirect blood pressure requires a stethoscope and a sphygmomanometer. The stethoscope used should have tubing long enough to allow the clinician to view the manometer while listening to Karotkoff sounds. The bell of the stethoscope should be used as it permits better auscultation of Karotkoff sounds. A sphygmomanometer consists of a blood pressure cuff containing a distensible bladder, a rubber bulb with an adjustable valve, and a flexible tubing. The tube connects to a manometer which measures the pressure within the cuff. Each part of the sphygmomanometer should be examined on a regular basis to be sure that it is functioning correctly. The needle on an aneroid manometer should rest at zero before and after each blood pressure measurement. Aneroid manometers should have calibration performed at least every six months. Blood pressure readings should be done when the patient is in a resting state. The patient should be seated for five minutes prior to checking a blood pressure so that the reading is not artificially elevated due to the exertion of walking to the room. The arm should be bare to the shoulder. A study looking at the effect of taking blood pressure through clothing showed little average change, but found that in patients with hypertension, there can be individual differences of plus or minus 20 millimeters of mercury or more when compared with measurements on bare skin. The patient must be correctly positioned to accurately measure blood pressure. The patient needs to have legs uncrossed and feet resting on a firm surface. The patient's back and legs should be supported by the chair. The manometer should be at eye level of the care team member. The patient's arm should be supported at heart level. A common error in taking blood pressure is the use of an improperly fitted cuff. The appropriate cuff size is determined by the circumference of the arm at the midpoint between the olecranon process and the acromion process. The cuff will have the size range listed in centimeters. Once the correct cuff is selected, proper fit is verified using the index line that runs perpendicular to the length of the cuff and a range line that runs parallel to the length of the cuff. When a cuff fits appropriately, the inflatable bladder should cover about 80% of the circumference of the patient's arm. Using a cuff that is too short and narrow results in erroneously high blood pressure measurement. When a cuff is too large, blood pressure measurements will be erroneously low. The cuff should be applied 2 centimeters above the crease of the elbow. It should fit snugly but still allow two finger widths under the cuff. When the cuff is in place on the upper arm, the index line should fall within the range line. Next, find the brachial artery, which is palpable about 4 centimeters from the medial epicondyle on the anterior surface of the elbow. Place the stethoscope lightly against the skin over the brachial artery, being sure that the pressure is appropriate for good sound transmission. Make sure that the blood pressure cuff and clothing do not touch the stethoscope. Inflating the cuff to an arbitrary level will often lead to overinflation, which can be uncomfortable for the patient. Determining the pulse obliteration pressure will avoid overinflation. Rapidly inflate the cuff to 80 millimeters of mercury while palpating the radial artery pulse. Continue to inflate in 10 millimeter of mercury increments until the pulse disappears. Then, deflate the cuff at a rate of 2 millimeters of mercury per second noting the pulse obliteration pressure where the pulse reappears. You are now ready to measure the patient's blood pressure. Inflate the cuff to 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above the pulse obliteration pressure. Then, deflate the cuff at a rate of approximately 2 millimeters of mercury per second while listening with the stethoscope for Karotkoff sounds. As the pressure in the cuff is decreased, blood flow in the brachial artery increases which creates turbulence and generates Karotkoff sounds. Phase 1 Karotkoff sounds are clear tapping sounds that coincide with reappearance of a palpable radial or brachial pulse. 
systolic blood pressure is determined by the onset of phase 1 sounds. Phase 2 and 3 sounds are of no clinical significance and are described as softer and longer than crisper and louder. Phase 4 sounds become muffled and softer as the pressure measurement approaches the diastolic pressure, usually within 10 mm of mercury of true diastolic pressure. Phase 5 sound is not a sound, but rather is the level at which sounds disappear. The diastolic blood pressure is measured at the start of phase 5. To ensure that diastole has been reached, the cuff pressure should continue to be slowly deflated for an additional 10 mm of mercury beyond the fifth Karatkov sound. The blood pressure should be measured at least twice, waiting one minute between readings, then recording the average of the two measurements. In the following example, please listen for the various phases of the Karatkov sounds while you observe the reading on the manometer. An auscultatory gap is defined as the intermittent disappearance of the initial Karatkov sounds after their first appearance. This phenomenon can lead to underestimation of systolic blood pressure. Obtaining the pulse obliteration pressure can be helpful in avoiding incorrect measurement. Certain conditions, such as cardiac arrhythmias, may complicate blood pressure measurement or interpretation. In these circumstances, decreasing the rate of deflation and averaging several readings may improve accuracy. Observer bias is the most common error that occurs in blood pressure measurements. It occurs because practitioners often show digit preference or round off the terminal digit. When two people use the same correct technique for measuring blood pressure, there should be little variation in the reading they obtain. By following the process demonstrated in this video, you will be able to correctly measure the blood pressure of your patients. Getting accurate measurements is crucial for your care team and your patient because blood pressure data is used to classify patients, to stratify their cardiovascular risk, and to monitor the effects of treatment.